All right, we are finally ready to um, start sculpting the design that we sketched in the last section. So I have a blank um, 3D coat canvas here. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is bring in that sketch uh, as reference. So if you hover up here and click this uh, image reference right here, and then we'll click, uh, you can pick any of these options. I'm just going to click ref image for the X axis and I'll select the uh, sketch we did before. Click open and uh, they're placed. That's on the X axis, of course, just like we, we asked for it to be. So actually this uh, kind of placed in here really quite large. So if I zoom, continue to zoom out, we'll sort of see the whole boundary. Um, and when we import, uh, when we imported that, this uh, menu option came up here. Uh, I'm just going to un unfurl this menu here by clicking the pin. And right away we get some uh, transform gizmos to adjust it. So if I click the corner, um, the corner, what is that? Like a sphere here and uh, I'm able to shrink it down. Let's make it a bit more reasonable compared to the grid and zoom back back in. Okay, so um, this reference image menu has a couple of really important options which we should talk about. So um, this uh, show and hide button is going to be important. That's gonna, you know, uh, hide, hide the ref image itself. Um, of course we could flip it. Probably won't wanna do that too much. Uh, we could choose to, to select a different image if we want it, if we change our minds about which which sketch we wanted. Um, what else is here? Scale and move. It's that's a bit, uh, like a, a bit more accurate way or, or mathematical way of of just using these gizmos here. So I'm just going to use these because they're simpler and easier. I wouldn't try. I wouldn't stretch this too much just because you know we want to keep the proportions that we we used in the last section. Um, and then I, I believe I've set the hotkey for this reference image menu. Um, so for this show and hide, I'm going to set a hotkey for that right now, actually. So if I hold end, um, let's see, for hide, let's do H. Oh, H is important already. That actually brings you to the layer that you're hovering over. Um, let's do control H. Oh, no, that's already assigned to uh, parenting. So let's not do that. Uh, I have to think of a new one, Alt-H, there we go. So now Alt-H will show and hide that. Um, I'm gonna switch into orthographic mode. And you'll notice the uh, if I snap to the wrong view, this image actually disappears and that's because it's only on the x-axis, right? So I need to be careful. Uh, it, it's gonna only show up when we're facing the correct uh, you know, direction on the x-axis. Um, and then this close guides one is going to be important too. That kind of gets gets rid of uh, well, it got rid of those green boundary boxes, but also got rid of the menu. Um, so to get the menu back, you have to go up here and um, edit image placement is the option. So yeah, be careful about that. Okay, so um, uh, the first thing we're going to do is um, place a primitive shape on top of here and see how we can use it. I'm going to make a new layer um, just in case and spacebar, select primitives, and uh, we're going to go ahead and do a uh, oval shape. And I'm going to try starting out with one of these rooftops up here. So if I place this generally in the right place and uh, stretch it out to about the right proportions and I hit enter, um, I'm just going to click that. And uh, you'll see that this um, image placed exactly halfway but, uh, in the middle of this um, object. And uh, that's quite useful, but there's a few more a few more things we can do to the image placement menu. So again, if I click this and uh, add image placement, we get this menu back. And I just want to show this um, opacity will change the uh, opacity of the reference image that we just imported. So I think by default, it's, it's on 0.5, right, 50%. Uh, this inside opacity is quite important too, and that you'll see it's changing the um, opacity of the sketch inside the um, inside the voxel object. So I use that one quite a bit actually, because depending on what we're doing at any given moment, uh, we're going to want uh, to see more or less of the interior there. All right, and I've sped up the video here once again, uh, just like we did with the sketching section. I think it's probably more useful if 
uh, go back in and record after the fact, and I can tell you what was working and uh, what wasn't. So I just uh, right off the bat there, I tried uh, putting in symmetry and adjusting that shape with the move tool, and I wasn't happy with it, so I deleted it, and I ended up using the cutoff tool just uh, there on the top. Um, and to get that rounded edge, I just uh, switched over to the smooth tool and um, upped the strength of the smooth smoother, um, and then uh, you know smoothed that edge and then um, adjusted it a little bit with the move tool once it was generally right. Uh, but the move tool is sort of um, it's sort of a small adjuster. I think it's it's rare that it uh, works for sculpting the whole shape. So I'll just cut off uh, that crescent shape there, and I'm just adjusting um, this, you know, the tapering of this edge a little bit with more smoothing. And um, it's, it's always a balance with sculpting these kinds of shapes between uh, which edges you want to be, you know, sharp and which which edges you want to be smooth. And it, and you constantly, you know, going back and forth uh, between those two. And it's uh, especially tricky with a really, you know organic shape like this. Some edges we do want sharp and some some we don't. So um, you know we'll we'll jump back and forth with the cutoff and the smoother. So right there I use that trick where I um, I held shift to cut off the exterior of the oval shape uh, just like we talked about with the tools and um, just adding in you know the base of that roof and I'm just kind of blocking in some some general shapes here. Um, you know, if something doesn't work, I'll delete it and start over, and that's completely fine. So this big uh, pillar shape is going to be really tricky to, to pull off. I, I wasn't even sure how to start, and you can kind of see that here. I just sort of blocked it in with the oval, and I think I did use the move tool to like get it generally following the sketch. Then I'll, I'll cut off pieces of it, and I'm just going to try some different things here and see if I can get it to look right. Um, so yeah, so the cutoff tool it had it gave us that really sharp edge, right? So I had to use the smoother to even um, get it generally right. And I'll adjust with the pose tool. I'm constantly adjusting the um, resolution, right? And the resolution, just like we talked about, uh, it matters how sharp your edge is going to be with all these tools. So if um, you know if my resolution is too high, then the cutoff tool will be really sharp every time I make a cut. So uh, let's see. Right now, I had to check on. You can probably see I accident that issue right there with the jagged edges was because I had to check off, uh, off ignore back faces, um, uh, and uh, yeah, that that was kind of giving me an issue. You'll see constantly like I'm running into, you know, issues as I go through the sculpting process, just because there's always like a little checkbox that I forgot was on. You kind of have to like troubleshoot to figure out exactly. You know why you're getting an issue, but uh, you know it's worth it. It's it's a great program to use once you sort through those issues. So I'm using the pinch tool there, and that's kind of my secret weapon to get back um, the sharp edge if I've over smoothed something and I can't you know control Z it. And then the other trick is this right here, where I'm I'm wrote, I'm using the cutoff tool. Um, but not an orthographic. I'm just kind of rotating it at like a three-quarter view and then cutting it off there. And that kind of gives, you know, another dimension or a, another edge uh, to this um, shape. So I'm messing with the sharpness of the edge of the smoother. I'm not quite uh, happy with it. You know, at this scale, a you know, this is supposed to be a big building, right? So nothing is going to have a really, really sharp edge, or at least I don't want it to feel that way. Everything is going to be kind of beveled just a little bit, and every, you know, it'll vary how beveled it would be, um, you know, based on, on, you know, the design and what feels right and, and what it actually is, you know, if it's an architectural piece or not. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, you probably don't want a perfectly sharp 3D edge to everything. All right, so I'm using the Vox hide uh, the box tool now to try and get these uh, intricate, you know, uh, golden lines in there. And I could have done this a lot of different ways, honestly, but uh, the one I went with is with that um, red curves tool there. 
and that kind of allowed me to place the points to get like a smooth curve. Um, and I, I decided to, you know, I could have sculpted the, the yellow filigree, um, you know, wireframe as a separate object, uh, but I decided to just cut it out of the original object. Um, and I, I think, you know, I probably could have done it either way, honestly, but the, the one thing about that is you probably want to save the original object as a new layer, which I believe I did. Although I don't see it there, I would have, if I had duplicated it, I would have hidden it, right? Um, to save the original, uh, you know, undestroyed layer and then sculpted on the new layer. So I, I don't think I did that here, but I would recommend that if you're going to make a big change, you might as well save it, you know, duplicate it and save it as a new layer. Okay, so I've kind of cut those um, three shapes there. And I was just kind of uh, messing with the shaders. And I'm adding um, shaders, you know, the red and green materials here. I I'm not expecting the final result to be red and green, right? Um, but I'm just adding them for my own visual sense to like understand that these are eventually going to be broken up into different uh, segments, right? OK, so um, you'll see as I go, it's quite important to keep things as grouped and um, clean as possible. And I, I'm kind of guilty of that, you know, of, of having kind of complex layers that aren't grouped in cl that clean in uh, Photoshop quite often. But with 3D code, it's so important to, to keep um, a little bit cleaner. So, you know, if we want to duplicate that whole segment, which I had tried a second ago, uh, you know, we will need that whole piece to be in a group. So just keep that in mind. One trick that I'm doing right here is I duplicated the red object, made it gold, and then I shrunk it just a little bit and then used it as a Boolean to cut out the middle of that red shape. So that's kind of my little trick to make an object into a shell. Um, you know, in a regular 3D program, that would be super easy because they're already shells, but with voxel objects, they're already filled all the way through. So you kind of have to do that uh, Boolean trick to kind of cut out the middle of them. Okay, so I'm trying to uh, place that top piece right there um, just to block it in. And I think I end up deleting it because it, it's, um, I'm not, I haven't figured out how to integrate that uh, kind of anvil shape at the top there yet. Um, so I just kind of, kind of have it placed there for now, just for my own uh, sense. But uh, you know, we'll we'll get into integrating it with the rest of the shape later. But for now, I think I have to do a bit more legwork in the in the actual sculpting. So right now, I'm trying to get um, you know I, I created these cutout lines for this golden filigree, but I'm trying to make give them some dimension, and uh, I ended up just doing that by making another cutout line uh, right next to it for the other one. And then for this one, I'm actually going to make a Boolean uh, operation where I, I duplicated the shape that I had cut out. I made it gold, and then I, uh, you know, I made it. Um, I, I, you know, made the duplication the metallic color, and then um, I believe I end up just Boolean cutting it like we talked about uh, in the last section, going over all the tools uh, just to to give us those kind of dimensional lines there. Uh, I probably should have used the curves tool for that uh, that shape. Um, you know, looking back, that probably would have given us more accuracy, but, uh, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and we will use the curves tool a little bit later for some other shapes. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm now thinking about this tower here at the top, just because that's kind of the next biggest uh, segment, and I'm not sure how to start it. <laughs> Uh, there's probably a you know a hundred ways to start everything with this type of thing, um, but I ended up with a sphere there, and I put on the radial array for the symmetry, and I ended up just making a cut uh, at a slight rotation there, and the the radial symmetry you know made I think it was eight different cuts all the way around, and then once I had that shape, now we can put on uh, uh, take off radial symmetry and just put on you know regular symmetry on the on the x-axis, I believe, 
and then that'll give us that front back cutout that I just did there. All right, and we'll uh, continue with this tower cap right here. I'm not, not doing anything too crazy in terms of tools. I'm still mainly just using box, you know, box hide. Um, with the you know different uh, different e menu options for for making selections you know box or uh, with the little curves with the points there um, I'll, I'll maybe take this opportunity to talk about so I'm not matching the you know the sketch exactly I'm not too worried about making every line you know line up exactly in orthographic mode I mean our, our sketch was super loose anyways um, so we're we're enhancing a sketch or hoping to enhance the sketch a little bit as we go um, and not not get too caught up in the exact details of it we're just kind of using it as a guide um, you know what's what's that pirates of the caribbean quote they're more like guidelines than actual rules uh, and that's kind of how i see the the sketch um, for this whole process actually so i just use the pose tool there to add a little bit of a flare in that tower shape um, and I struggled, I think, to use the box hide here uh, a little bit because I was getting those really jagged edges every time I, I uh, made a cut there. Um, and that could be due to quite a few things. Generally speaking, it's probably just too low res of a mesh. Um, so I, I think I up it there and that solved the problem. Like we talked about in the other section, you also kind of might have to check if you need to switch your object uh, to global space or to uniform space. Um, and that should hide some of the jagged edges there. And you can see I had actually didn't sol totally solve those jagged edges. Um, I ended up just kind of using the smooth tool to smooth over them at the end, just because I, I got frustrated. I couldn't figure out why I was getting them. And it might have just been the angle. I'm still not completely sure. There's a few times when I, you know, 3D coat is a little bit, uh, frustrating or buggy or odd and uh, to me that's just kind of part of its uh, part of what you have to deal with there's there's so many great and easy to use aspects of it that I kind of just live with that I'm you know constantly using this curves tool to make exact selections um, and I I highly recommend kind of uh, using using that e-menu tool at, at least getting comfortable with it you know, you can you can make those points and move them around and uh, use them in a variety of ways. All right, so we're finally getting to the curves tool now, and uh, we talked a little bit about how to use it in the previous section, and we're going to see it in action here. In my mind, uh, this is going to be that golden filigree from the sketch. Um, we we're kind of talking about how I wanted it to be sort of like a wire frame uh, extra piece. So that's why I'm considering using the curves tool for this section. I have it on symmetry mode uh, right away, so it's you know it's placing uh, two two different sides uh, as I go. And my main my main concern with this is getting a nice first of all a nice overall flow to the shape, but also having a nice variety of thicks and thins in there because if it was all one uh, you know circumference on that piping. It wouldn't feel as elegant, I think. It would just feel kind of like a big tube or pipe, and that's not the, the energy we're going for. Now that I kind of have the shape sort of blocked in there with the curves tool, here's where it gets a little bit tricky because I kind of struggle with getting the thicks and thins to kind of feel the right way. You can see I'm using the pose tool there just to kind of try and enhance that. And in my mind, it it really makes a big difference because I, again, I'm really just worried about this big uh, kind of similar uh, circumference or diameter of this like kind of big pipe, and that wouldn't feel wouldn't feel like an elegant fantasy shape. So I'm trying to make it um, flow from not only thick to thin, but also sort of from curvy to sharp. Maybe there's like a little bit of a almost a point to the curve there. I'm sort of experimenting with the flow of that. And I think that ends up making a big difference in the final design too, because there's like different line qualities when you're drawing, right? There's uh, there's shaky lines, there's sharp lines, there's you know curved lines, and I I kind of am a believer that 
that's sort of true in, in design in general as well, not just in line drawings. I don't, I don't have a better way to describe it other than line quality, but as, as your eye is kind of flowing over this design, I'm hoping basically that there's a variety of curves to follow. They're not all the same. First of all, they're not all the same angle of curve. They're also sort of sharp curves. There's big, you know, obtuse curves. There's small little acute curves. Hopefully you kind of see what I'm saying as I'm blocking in uh, some of these filigree shapes here. It, it it's kind of all goes back to the big, medium, and small breakup, right? I, it's, you know, big, medium, and small shapes, but also big, medium, and small uh, curves, big, medium, and small flow to different shapes. Hopefully that makes some sense. I know I'm kind of talking a lot about design theory in this sculpting section, uh, but first of all, we're not talking, we're not really using any completely new sculpting tools right now, uh, but also, I'm, I'm really a big believer that each step of the process, you should sort of try and enhance the design, right? So that's why I kind of kept the sketch loose um, and we're gonna go from there. And you can see I'm, I'm really kind of getting obsessed with the fix and fins uh, of this curve, this curvy shape. Uh, I know that I'm gonna be duplicating it around uh, the, the entire design quite a bit. So that's why I wanna get it kind of perfect and something that I'm really happy with. And you see right there, I'm, I'm gonna mess around. I even hid the sketch at this point because I'm kind of going off scripts so much. Uh, you know, these these flowing filigree shapes, I feel are tying these bigger blockier architectural shapes together. So I know there's gonna be a lot more of them in there that uh, than I kind of showed in the sketch. And, you know, back to the thicks and thins of the curve shape, maybe a a good point of reference to think about there would be the Nike swoosh, because uh, everyone knows that logo. It's uh, iconic and recognizable for a reason. And it's just so, there's something about the contrast of just the tiny little, uh, you know, side of the check mark or the swoosh mark versus the nice swooping curvy shape that's, you know, larger that leads you to it. That's, that's kind of the thinking I'm going for. So I just made everything a nice uh, green and gold shader just for readability. I know we had three different values in the, uh, in the sketch, uh, but just keeping it to two for now, I think is uh, helping me sort of group things together in, in my mind and in my design brain. And I'm still not sure, you know, maybe when we get to Blender, we'll end up with, uh, with two values instead of three. And right now I'm doing a little upkeeping. It, uh, everything, all my layers are getting way too messy, so I just grouped everything together. It took quite some time, and that's all with the Shift H hotkey, that change parent hotkey I showed in the other section. And I had to do that for this step. So I, what I did is I went to the instancer, and I, I clicked New Mirrored Instance, and that only works on, you know, a big, a big group like this if they're all grouped nicely. So that's kind of why I had to do that, and I just wanted to see how it would look. We're gonna end up doing the mirroring itself in Blender actually, just because it, it uh, works with instancing and, and it's much uh, much better than 3D Coat does. But I just wanna kind of check it right there here in 3D Coat. And you know we're only doing the right half of this whole design for now in 3D Coat. In the back of my mind, we're gonna do a lot more sort of layout and mirroring in Blender. But for now, we just need to get the, the assets sculpted. All right, so right now I'm actually adding a little bit of an emphasis to the kind of the tip or the point of this shape. Uh, that's that little golden um, kind of egg shape I added there at the end. I actually wasn't quite happy with the uh, the way the green part of the shape was, was coming to a point there. And if you remember in the sketching section, we ended up talking about, it was kind of a breakthrough, I think, when we added that point there. And it really, it's, I think it's because kind of the whole bigger shape leads you right up to that. So that point really needs to be emphasized. And also it, it's just one of the few sharp shapes on the whole sculpture or this whole segment of the building. So it really acts, it really contrasts nicely with all these big swooping curves. So that's why I'm kind of spending so much attention to it and trying to get it also to integrate really well with the rest of it. 
or tool? It will, it will, it, as long as you're selected on the top of your group, it will duplicate everything in that group and it will create a new, new group, a duplicate of it inside that group. So you actually have to go in and manually drag it outside of the original group, which is a little bit annoying, but uh, just keep that in mind. And I actually went ahead and merged that whole, so first of all, I uninstanced it. So um, instancing is the best way, I think, to make a duplication of the whole group. But then I uninstance it because I, I don't want the changes I'm gonna be making to it to affect the old version, right? Because uh, we want it to be a separate object. And then I merged the whole subtree. So I right clicked on the top of that new, that new group that I uninstanced and I clicked merge subtree and that just merged everything into one smooth green shape. And I did that because I just don't wanna to worry too much about all those little uh, golden filigree details that we had. And I just wanna make some big changes, uh, kind of like start with the, you know, the shape as a base for a new sculpt or a new sculpt, but be a little bit more free with it and, and make some bigger changes. So this next segment of the, of the you know, right half of our design. It's very similar, of course. It's the same exact shape language and, and general shapes of the other section. So we're gonna see how much we can reuse. This you know, bigger green shape that we just made had to change quite a bit, uh, but the golden roof part that we're about to duplicate over, I don't think it's that different. Uh, in fact, it's just a tiny bit of stretching I think I end up doing to it. So, you know, general practice, yeah, as long as there isn't too much change, it's probably best to, to instance here. And uh, one note on instancing in 3D Coat versus Blender. So I, I mentioned that I wanted to do a lot of the instancing and mirroring in Blender versus 3D Coat. And that's just because it's a lot, it's a little bit slower in, in 3D Coat, uh, the UI itself. And then also the program doesn't deal that well compared to Blender with a lot of heavy, you know, uh, objects with a lot of polygons. So actually this last segment right here, the roof shape is again duplicated and just really stretched out. And we're gonna have to make an individual change though to the tower proportion. So I had to select it out there and I'm moving it into, you know, parenting those, those elements into their own objects so that I could hide it. And then I did the same thing right there where I you know, took the pieces that I wanted to, I, I parent them, parented them into a new group and then duplicated that group. It's so fast to just re grab the pieces that you want and then uh, make them into a group. So now I'm finally ready to do this middle door section and it's, uh, it's gonna take a little bit of new sculpting. There's not too much we can reuse with this just because it is you know, some, some new shapes and it's very symmetrical. And uh, we started out with a sphere naturally. And, um, you know, from the side view, this, this door would be kind of curved because we started out with a sphere, uh, but I'm not gonna worry about that too much. Um, right now, I just wanted to give it some dimension. So I didn't start with, you know, with a box and uh, we can flatten things later and, and make things a little bit more architecturally sound. Right now, it's all about just getting the shapes to feel uh, similar to the sketch. So primarily from the sphere, all I'm using with this door section, a little bit of pose tool there, but mostly it's the, uh, the Vox tool again. Uh, you know, that's probably the most common tool. Looking, at, looking back on this, I probably use the Vox eye tool the, the most out of anything. Um, just to, you know, start splitting elements apart. And it also gives such a nice bevel to the new segment. It's, so, it's such a fast way to give a new segment a little bit of a, a, you know, a cut line with the, just the right amount of bevel. All right, I wanna take another minute here to talk about some design theory stuff. I know this is sculpting section, but uh, there's nothing too fancy here. Again, it's just all the, the box hide tool. Uh, so you'll notice I, I'm not too interested in adding that much extra detail to this door right now. Um, and that's for a few reasons, actually. Um, well, there's, there's a quote that I think about a lot. I, I actually don't know who it's, you know, attributed to, but it goes something like great design 
doesn't say look at me. It's uh, great design says look at this. And what I mean by that, or I, what I think that means is if you want an area to be a focal point, and I definitely want this entrance central area to be a focal point, it doesn't necessarily serve you to layer on details and filigree and extra elements onto that focal point. It's much more important to have really big uh, shapes in this case, or big architectural shapes that point you to it. So I've spent so much time on the rest of this building uh, and it's kind of, in my mind, all leading the eye to um, a couple places. I mean, there's a couple different reads on this structure, but you know, the entrance way is definitely one of the main focal areas that hopefully a lot of the work that we put in with these big flowing shapes, um, you know, in some simple, simple areas, but you know, carefully crafted shapes will lead you to. And the, the second read, uh, in this case, probably that tower on the top. Um, I took a little bit of extra um, sculpting time there to cut some of the edges off of the back of the, the uh, main green endel shape. I don't know if you caught that, um, but uh, I, I just wanted to give it a couple more edges there. And we're closing in on the final little main areas of the palace now we're just duplicating what we already have and shrinking it way way down to kind of fit that central uh, mirrored area and we're just going to do some uh, cleanup on this new sort of green area i uh, just use the smooth tool uh, maybe a little bit of the fill tool there just to get rid of some of uh, oddness and then additionally i'll use that cutoff tool just to give it a straight cut there um, and one important thing to note is when I when I made this original duplication, I think I talked about how I instance it uh, just so that I could duplicate the group as a whole, and then I then I uninstanced current. Um, and it's really important not to accidentally click uninstance all when you do that. Their buttons are right next to each other. I just want to put a word of warning out there because uh, if you do accidentally click that. First of all, the whole program might become very slow because everything will be uninstanced in the whole scene. And then also it might just crash, uh, which I think happened to me once or twice during this process. I accidentally clicked that uninstance all and then everything just sort of froze. So we're just adding some trim there at the bottom. We were still you know, in the back of our mind, back from the sketch phase, we talked about having a little bit of an architectural base or cap at the bottom. So I'm just adding some trim to that now. Um, and then additionally, this shape right here that I'm cutting out now, wasn't quite happy with. Um, I think we, we strayed a little bit from the sketch there and it wasn't uh, elegant and dynamic. So we ended up just tweaking that a little bit and trying to get it correct. And right here, it is freezing. And I believe that is because what I mentioned where I clicked the uninstance all and it just crashed. So definitely keep that in mind. So now I'm just trying to integrate the uh, base of the structure with what we had for the doorway. Um, it, I, I think I accidentally uh, forgot to uninstant something. So I accidentally messed up an earlier mesh, which is why that sort of pushed forward there. So we're, but that's okay. I'm not gonna, I, I just uninstanced it again so that we don't affect anything else. And then I'll just uh, adjust it further to try and integrate it with the doorway. It wasn't totally um, sort of like fitting together there anyways. And I'm doing a bit of a uh, pinch and smooth there on that edge. Again, it's very common to sort of go back and forth between the pinch and the smooth tool to get an edge either very, very sharp or very, very smooth. And we're gonna work a little bit now on this very uh, topmost kind of tower area. I think this was one of the areas on the sketch that we never uh, completely figured out compared to a lot of it. And it, it wasn't really integrating that well with the rest of it. I think in the sketch, we had sort of said that we would try and uh, fit fit that piece together it was in an organic way into the, uh, the rest of it. And I'm talking about just this whole section up here, this whole top kind of duplication part. So first of all, we have to adjust some of the proportions just so that we do get, you know, use the parts of the sketch that we're working. So that means we have to do a little bit of organization where I'm fitting the 
uh, the little tower section into its own group so that I can just shrink it down compared to the rest of it. And this this whole kind of section up here is feeling a little bit too big and heavy. It doesn't, in my mind, it, it currently feels a little bit like it's not quite believable. So I'm, I'm going to end up kind of deleting some of these parts here. And I'm kind of thinking that the general shapes as a skeleton should work. But uh, you know we can delete some big chunks of it so that it that we could keep the shapes, but it's a little bit less heavy on on the you know the rest of the architecture. So we've cut some holes here, and we're gonna do try and do a little bit of work to make it organically fit into the rest of it. So we're gonna cut a hole for the the other the earlier tower, and we're gonna do try some things on this side view. I mean, this is part of the sketch on the side here that, uh, of course, we didn't tackle with just our front view sketch. And uh, I don't just want it to be completely flat. I think as we kind of rotate around our model, it'd be nice if there's a little bit of attention to these sides. And uh, that's something I didn't talk about too much, actually, because we were following the front view sketch so much. But uh, of course, that's, that was a great place to start. But then we're going to do a little bit of design on, on both sides just so that we can kind of make everything match up. And then we're going to pay a little bit of attention uh, next to this golden wireframe filigree that's sort of flowing all around these shapes. Uh, in my mind, that's kind of the, the hack here or the, the trick that's going to tie all these, these pieces together. Uh, first of all, just having you know, flowing lines sort of uh, all around these these simpler objects, you know, the, it'll attract the eye and, and let the eye kind of flow around everything, which will help a lot. Um, and then also, it, it's sort of a, what I mean by a hack or a trick is that it's it's going to connect different pieces when in reality, you know, if this were a real architectural object, there would have to be a lot more inset and integration into the separate objects themselves uh, versus you know, if we use these flowing lines, we don't have to do as much of that, or hopefully we can get away with not doing as much of that uh, just by kind of using these shapes as, uh, again, as a, as a way to, to draw your eye around the object. And then of course, the, in, my, uh, in my mind as well, that sort of elegant flowing lines are what um, really uses the design language that we talked about with all the keywords right at the beginning where we, uh, we decided that we wanted, you know, an elegant, ornate, I think was one of them, you know, fantasy palace. Hopefully it's going to feel elvish because of all that. Uh, versus if we, you know, stuck with the simpler blockier shapes and added a lot of, you know, integration between them instead, it might not hit those keywords as much. It might take us in a slightly different direction. So yeah, I'm definitely keeping, you know, those initial design keywords in mind even at this stage, like there's still some extra designing we're doing, even though we're following the sketch a little bit, uh, you've got to keep your design brain turned on at all times, just so that you keep continuing to hit and you know what you wanted to hit. All right, so we're actually getting pretty close now to the end of this sculpting section. We're just going to be doing a little bit more cleanup. We're not going to be doing anything too crazy and new in terms of tools. We're just kind of focusing on design and trying to get it to feel a little bit finished. So I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the whole sculpting process and kind of what we learned and uh, what we used. So if you really think about it, in this tutorial, we really only used like, what, five or six sculpting tools. And I mean, it was kind of like the pose tool, the box hide, uh, cutoff, and maybe the transform tool to move things around, right? Uh, I guess the pinch and smooth kind of combo just to clean up edges, we did quite a bit. And then probably the resample tools, it should be in there just because we're doing that all the time to you know push and pull and uh, with the resolution. And I guess lastly, an instant search should probably be on that list just because it's so important for duplicating groups. But Anyways, I highly recommend sort of keeping it simple like that. Just to learn, really get to know a few tools like that. It doesn't have to be those ones even. You know, you should look at, try them all and see what you like. But uh, when you're learning a new program, I find just, you know, really learning a, a small piece of it or a small set of tools like that 
and really getting to know them and understand them is probably going to give you uh, better results in the end. So I highly recommend doing that. And then uh, just kind of one more piece of philosophy in terms of learning new programs that I found to have really helped me is sort of thinking about it differently when you're doing personal work and professional work. So what I mean by that is kind of maybe try and use your personal work time to really push and learn new programs like this and try different tools that you haven't tried before. And then when it comes time to do client and professional work, you uh, you kind of stick with what you know more within that program. And then, you know, you're able to hit deadlines quicker because uh, you're, you're not like messing around and totally learning new things. And you're also going to feel much more confident with, you know, the, the tools that you are trying. And I think ultimately that your, your client work will, you know, will improve from that. So that, that general sort of philosophy is um, sort of served me pretty well over the last few years. And, uh, you know, if you're diving into 3D code right now, of course, the ultimate goal probably is to use it for professional work. But, you know, give yourself some time to really get acquainted with it. All right, so back to the sculpting itself. So we're just kind of adding in these attachments here for that uh, little extra front turret to sort of sit into. And I think it's super important, even though it's not really in the sketch, just to have some kind of believable uh, attachment there. I think I was even on my other monitor sort of looking at uh, like torches that you would hang on the wall and how those are connected to like a stone wall, for example just as sort of a point of reference. And then of course we're using like these really elegant flowing uh, golden pieces here so that it matches the rest of our design. And um, in a second, we're going to uh, focus on sort of the middle area with the like walkway and then of course the doorway itself. And I end up kind of reintroducing a little bit more fanciful detail into the door. I know I talked earlier about keeping it simple because it's one of the focal points. Uh, but I think adding on a little bit extra of the golden filigree at the end uh, sort of brings back, brings it or connects it to like the design language of a lot of the other areas that we spent some time on. So here you can see just sort of adding that little attachment above the door itself, uh, just to kind of, again, keep it in the same language feel the same as a lot of the other areas. Right there, that was just the pose tool to sort of bend it back. Uh, that's a trick that we talked about earlier with the pose tool, where if you use it the correct way, you can kind of get these really bendy shapes with it. Um, and if you've forgotten that or need a reminder on that, that's on the earlier tool section. So we're just going to add a little bit of trim on these door pieces. I'm not even going to change the design, but I felt like uh, each each you know, segment needed a little bit of a trim around the edge just to feel like it's a little bit more true to what architecture actually looks like. And then I just wanted like a little bit of a circle design here in the middle, but I decided it kind of wasn't working. It didn't really need it. So I'll end up deleting that. And then I just add a little cut line to the middle of the door so that it feels like it could open. Um, and then from the side view here, we're going to try and add another uh, kind of flowing uh, layer or, or shape here. And I really felt like this kind of curve of this door wasn't interesting enough from a side view. It was too, you know, we started out with a sphere, so it was too simple. So just adding on a few more extra little elements to the silhouette um, are, were, I think, helpful. And then those elements that we created kind of as a last stage here, actually, a last step, I decided to duplicate that and sort of use it in other areas of the design. And I think this really helped as kind of a final last little touch to uh, one, more, one more kind of fanciful uh, flowing shape to really tie everything together. And we're just gonna duplicate that sort of double line there and um, place it in a few different areas of the design. Yeah, I'm kind of just emphasizing what we already had in the sketch, actually. Um, in the sketch, we had kind of this inner detail with this double yellow line, and uh, we're, we're just adding that in in a different way, right? Uh, it's the same. It's following the design similarly, I think. We're just uh, using 3D space to sort of accenting it a little bit more. 
And uh, I tried sort of adding that into the middle here. I think it's ended up sort of breaking the nice flow uh, in, in the other reverse way. So now if I change it this way, it sort of follows the shape that we had already established and I was much happier with it. Okay, so uh, just taking a look here from the front view, sort of assessing what needs to be done. And as a very last touch, I realized that a lot of these flowing shapes, although I liked their placement and I liked how they, uh, you know, made the eye sort of flow nicely along the object, they weren't actually going into anywhere. They weren't integrating very well with the shapes. So I'm just going to select the pieces that sort of need a little uh, circular cut for them to fit into. And we'll just use the uh, cutoff or box or, or whatever you want to use to sort of make a little inset there for them to go into. And uh, it, was, it seemed like it would be super easy. It was a little trickier than I expected just because I had to go from an angle uh, for that you know, cutoff, uh, circular cutoff to feel right for a lot of them. Uh, but ultimately, it, it wasn't too bad. Just going, going over the design and adding that little, little extra detail, I think, help, helps a lot when you zoom in. And, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if you use the box hide for something like this, uh, if you're never going to show the geometry that you hid, right? So it ends up acting just like the cutoff, actually, um, which is why I don't remember which one I used there. Uh, as long as you don't show, show the pieces, it'll just be hidden within, you know, uh, 3D Code's memory forever. So it won't, it won't matter too much. All right. So we're pretty much done with the main design. Uh, I'm just going to add in some windows now uh, as a very, very last sort of scale step. And, um, you know, adding little architectural, there's a few architectural details when you're doing architecture design that really you need to pay attention to for scale. Um, you know, ma mainly it's, you know, windows, stairs, you know, doors, things that relate to an actual human size. Um, and I'm going to try and place, I'm going to try to make this window as a separate object and place it around. Um, that way I don't have to, if I decide I want to change the scale later, I can just shrink them individually. Um, instead, rather than, you know, actually cutting them into the main, uh, the main shapes, I, I would sort of be stuck with that scale forever. So that's why I kind of went this direction. And uh, I think when we get into the blender phase, we may want to adjust some scale of the windows and, and some maybe add in some more details actually that, that relate to human scale. So um, I just want to keep them sort of, uh, you know, movable and, and editable as much as possible. Running into a slight problem here though, and that's the uh, curve of this building in the front uh, is actually right it's a it's a concave curve so sort of slotting a flat window in there is a little bit tricky um, and it, it doesn't even really make that much architectural sense but i don't it doesn't really matter i think from kind of the scale that we want to show this from the front probably is going to be how our final concept is all i want to see are just some little window details it doesn't really matter to me how well they're integrated within the curve of that structure as long as it doesn't break the overall flow of the shape, and as long as I can read the window from a distance, I think that's kind of all I'm going for. And I'll try and add them into this turret as well. I think I ended up shrinking the scale of them all down just because when I got into the turret, it felt like the size of the window I had was a little bit too big. So I was definitely happy that I had kept them editable because I already, I already wanted to go back and make changes. So uh, we'll probably be doing that again in the next stage. And I'm just du instancing and duplicating that around. Uh, the way the way we created that makes it super easy to do. So we can always add in more later as well. And uh, we're going to try and just add in enough little window shapes. It doesn't have to be a hundred, but just you know, just a few sprinkled around to to give a sense uh, of the general scale here. You know, one thing to mention with the windows is that. Um, I think a little bit of a Boolean shape within the window would help a lot, but I'm not gonna do that now, again, because I just don't want to be destructive with the mesh. So we might do that in Blender in the next stage. We'll see if it needs it. Um, but right, just cutting into the sill of that window just to make a little kind of space inside there um, would kind of give everything 
a nice uh, dimension. All right, so we're pretty much done. I'm gonna switch over to the renderer view just to check it with some nice writing. Rotate around, try to see if there's anything we missed. And uh, we're pretty much ready to export and take everything over to Blender. So let's uh, get into exactly how to do that and we'll be done. All right, so let's talk about how to export these uh, meshes into an OBJ format. Um, just so that we can import it back into Blender and get started with that phase. So I'm just going to show you how I do it. And uh, this will vary a little bit depending on how uh, heavy the meshes are and, and how much is going on in the scene. But uh, if we take a look over here, we've, we've got some uh, hidden pieces in here that we don't want to export. So we're just going to ignore those. And then you've got to pay close attention when you're doing this to the groups and whether they're, they've got this little plus check mark or minus check, uh, you know, symbol. And in this case, we want to open up all of the groups by clicking the plus sign, okay? So this is gonna be really important for the way that I'm going to export this. So make sure you do this. So I'm gonna go carefully over all the layers here, make sure absolutely everything has a minus sign. That means all the groups are unfurled, right? And then anything that's hidden, uh, we're going to want to, you know, double check whether we want to use it or not. And if we do want it to export, we should show it and unfurl it. Okay. In this case, I'll keep that hidden just because I'm going to show this small piece. And then we're going to go back to the top. And now that everything's unfurled, we're going to do this in small segments. So if the easiest way to do this would be to click File, Export, Export Scene. But we don't want to do that because in a really complex scene, That'll export everything in there and uh, the mesh will be way too heavy for Blender to even open sometimes. So we're actually going to use this one right under here called export selected objects, but we're not going to select them all at once. We're going to do it in a few different sets. And this is just so that 3D Coat doesn't freak out with how much we're exporting and also Blender doesn't freak out with how much we're importing, right? So um, if you click a group and click export selected objects, it doesn't export the whole group. So that's why I had you unfurl them. So if I click this and hold shift to select, I'll just select about, uh, let's say, let's open this up a bit more. From there to about there, let's say, and you can see them flash and then I'll just show what's being exported. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. I just wanna make sure we get everything that's shown. So now that I've selected a section, we're gonna click file, export, export selected objects. And we'll call this palace set one, let's say. And we'll hit save. And then you get this green loading bar for a second. And then this will come up. And this is a little bit of a decimator that 3D Code offers. And it, uh, when you export objects, you definitely want to decimate them a lot. Otherwise, they'll be way too heavy. So you can actually hover here and click and drag to slide this up or down. And in general, with 3D Coat, you want to over correct with the decimate, decimate. So you can actually, generally speaking, go to 75% or more without really getting any loss of detail. So somewhere in the 75% range. And then right here is the number that will tell you exactly how many polys uh, the final result will be. And I'm going to try and keep each set that we export to a little bit under a million. So I'll actually go a little bit higher with this, and then it'll be lower with that, and we'll get it just under a million. I'm finally happy with that. I'll click OK. It'll load that. It's decimating those pieces. And we'll give it a sec to think. Might take a minute, depending on how many are in your set. And it's finally done. So now I'm going to export the next set. I'm going to do that very carefully by clicking the one the layer right below our last selected, just so that I don't forget where we are in the list. Then I'll scroll down and select, oh, let's say about 10 more or something, approximately. This isn't going to be exact. So now I'm exporting that set. I'll repeat file, export selected objects. We'll do palace set two so that we don't get confused. And I'll click save. Same process. It'll think for a second, depending on how complex this is. And in this case, we're going to even reduce all the way to about 85 or 87. Let's say 86. That's OK if it's a little bit above a million. OK. It'll think for a second. 
And, uh, you know, this will be, uh, this will be self-explanatory why we're doing this when we get into Blender. And it's kind of because Blender is not very good actually with very, very dense, heavy objects. So if I were to export all of these at once, um, Blender would just not, it would, it would probably crash when we opened it, especially if we didn't decimate very much. So just reiterate, file, export selected objects, palace set three. And in this case, I'll show you what happens. Uh, I'll, I'll try exporting it with, you know, even more reduction. Let's go all the way up to, we don't want to go too high. If you go too high, um, things will be decimated too much and you'll lose all your careful sculpting work, right? So, you know, this is all of these objects together were decimated down to this poly count. So you got to be careful with it. So again, I generally, for Blender anyways, I'm going to go just under a million, click OK. All right, so I'm not going to not gonna bore you with exporting all my different sets. It's going to be quite a few in the final scene because it is more complex than this little in-progress object that we have here. So um, I'm going to stop the video and we'll see exactly how many sets I end up doing. In this case, I would probably have to do only one more, but that's only this piece, right? So there's going to be a lot more. We might even get like 20 different sets. And then we'll import those sets one by one into Blender and uh, go from there.